the church today has unprecedented spiritual resources. I have 43,376 Bibles in 1,267 different languages. Now, I don't know if you know this, but 97% of statistics are made up on the spot. I made up those statistics. I don't know how many Bibles I actually have. Uh, it's not 42,000, but it's a lot. Uh, I have a lot of Bibles in a lot of different languages. And the fact of the matter is, when I travel now, I don't even carry a Bible most of the time because it's extra weight. And I have my, my phone that has every Bible I could possibly want on it. And I have my computer, which has an entire... I'm getting rid of most of my books because I have the Logos uh, Platinum or whatever Scholar's Edition that has something like five or 10,000 books on it, and it goes with me wherever I go. It's in my hard drive. And so when I study, I study with that. That's why my Bible stays here on the pulpit. I have other ones on my desk too. But I, I just, I use a computer Bible. And I have all these, I have all these resources. We have Christian books and radio and websites and social media. And yet in spite of all of this, Americans are more biblically illiterate than they've ever been. Ask the average American Christian churchgoer questions that as a sixth grader, I would have said, well, that's easy. And a lot of them don't know the answers to that. I was at a BCI meeting some years ago, Baptist Convention of Iowa meeting, and I noticed the evangelism table. And there was something over 12 million evangelism strategies offered. On, now, once again, that's a, a statistic I just made up. I didn't count them, but there were dozen, a dozen or more evangelism strategies right there. We have boxes of tracks. I just moved three boxes of tracks that were buried under stuff in the back there. Uh, we have movies and events, all of these. Now, I'm going to share some real statistics with you. Uh, in a moment here. These are all statistics that I received from some authoritative sources at conferences. I, I don't know the sources of all of them. Some of them I do, and I'll try to share that with you. But our denomination is perhaps the most aggressively evangelistic of American denominations, and still pre-COVID, before COVID hit, I don't think this has gotten any better, 70% of our churches were either plateaued or declining. Three out of four, more than three, and I'm guessing that number has gone up because most churches are about half of what they were or 60% or so of what they were before COVID, or a lot of churches are. So that number has probably gone up dramatically. The Caskey Institute, which was the group that was our major sponsor back in 2017 when I was the president of the Southern Baptist Pastors Conference um, for that year. Uh, the, the leader of that, uh, Mark Tolbert, told me an amazing fact. They did a study of why evangelism isn't working in the Southern Baptist Convention, and he said they found out an amazing fact. Evangelism isn't working in the Southern Baptist Convention because churches aren't evangelizing. For the most part, churches have stopped doing evangelism. We do outreach, but most outreach is designed to get people to come to church, not to share the gospel with the lost. It's designed not to build the kingdom, but to put more people into the seats of the church. In fact, in a lot of churches, they avoid the hard truths of the gospel because they're afraid that might drive people away. People aren't sharing the gospel individually. Churches aren't really sharing the gospel corporately. And he says, if you don't do evangelism, evangelism can't be that successful. Several years ago, in the, probably in the early 2000s, Jimmy Barentine, our former executive director of the Baptist Convention of Iowa, shared a statistic that struck me. Um, and at that point, it went for the previous 20 years. And I don't know exactly the parameters, uh, what two 10-year two periods it was, 
but during those two 10-year periods, over two decades, there was not a single county in the United States that saw a net church growth. Now, there were individual churches that grew, but generally, when a church grows, it grows by draining other churches. One church grows not by winning the loss to Christ, but by taking people from other churches. They have something newer, something bigger, something better, and everybody leaves church A, B, C, D, E, F, and G to go to church H. And that church grows, oh, the church is doing great, but what they've done basically is there's just sheep trails from one church to the other. And in all of America, not one county, now there's been at least one decade since then, probably a decade and a half, and I don't know if this statistic has changed, but there was, not one dec- one, there was not one county that saw overall net church growth. This was shared by Ray Comfort several years ago, a major denomination, not Southern Baptist. I know the denomination, I'm not going to name them. But another major, probably the other denomination that could vie with us for being the most aggressively evangelistic denomination in America did a study of all of their evangelism and what they found is that after one year 85 percent of their converts the people that had been reached had reverted to their life of sin and showed no change in their lifestyle now if a salesman sold all of this stuff and 85 percent of the people brought the stuff back that salesman might get called into the office and say what's going on here an 85 percent now even paul had you know demas hath forsaken me because he loved this it happens jesus lost one of his disciples but 85 percent here's the statistic i heard doing evangelism explosion from their study 95 percent of christians never lead another person to faith in Jesus Christ. Never in their entire lives. With all of our wealth, with all of our resources, with everything the church of Jesus Christ has at its fingertips, the American church is still failing in its evangelistic efforts. Now, consider this small band. This is not an actual picture of the early disciples. Hope you recognize that. (laughs) not a lot of those available this small band of disciples who wandered in galilee together wondering what their lives would become until jesus gave them the great commission and sent them the holy spirit to help them these men were charged with taking the gospel to the ends of the earth and they'd never shown particular ability as we've said often they owned no property the treasury of the church was bare They had no resources, no curriculum, no materials, no programs. There were no church growth strategies or experts available to lead them. They had none of the things that we believe are essential for church growth today. They had no hymnals, no instruments to lead them. There were no pollsters to gauge public opinions and tell them what to do. They didn't even have Bibles. They didn't have Bibles. Not a single effective evangelism strategy. There was no Romans Road because Romans hadn't been written yet. There was no bridge to life, no four spiritual laws, no evangelism explosion, none of that. And worse than that, listen, if you had the option of living in America 2022 under the government we have, and most of us here would express some level of angst over our government and where it stands on things. But if you had the choice, modern America under the current administration or first century Rome, can I give you a piece of advice about which choice to make? (laughs) You you do not want to go to Rome. It was... It, it, if you lived a year or two in Rome, you'd be like, oh, wow, let's go back to America. It, it, it smells a lot better now. And the religious leaders of the day 
had just conspired to have their leader murdered. Everything was against them. And in a little more than 30 years, these men turned, and women turned the world upside down. They had nothing and everything changed. Why is it that with all of our resources, all, the, all that we have, all of our advantages, our buildings, our strategies, our experts, were failing when the early church that had none of that succeeded? Now there are several answers, and in the few weeks ahead, I'm going to give another answer to that as we study Acts 2. But today I'd like to focus on one, and that is the Great Commission. I introduced this. This was meant to be one sermon last week. It's now going to be three messages. I'm going to finish this next week, and I am going to finish it next week. I really am. I promise. Boy Scout's honor. I was never a Boy Scout, but I was an R. No, it's a promise. It's a promise. <laughs> I, but last week we looked at the premise of the Great Commission, verse 18. Jesus said, I've been given all authority, now go. I give it to you. He, he has given us the right to issue gospel warrants on people's lives, to tell people that Jesus is Lord. Today, we're going to begin the process of looking at the process of the Great Commission, verses 19 through 20, uh, that explain what the, process, what the Great Commission is. And then we wrap up with the promise of the Great Commission where Jesus says, I will be with you. First, I want to say something. We've got to understand what a commission is. This is a commission. A commission is an instruction, command, or duty given to a person or group of people generally by someone in authority, by a commanding officer, or somebody who is over that person. Our commanding officer, our general, our Lord and Master gave us this command, this duty as he was leaving earth. The Great Commission, some of Jesus' last words, they're not an option. We treat them that way. He didn't say, if you have time in your busy schedule, go and make disciples. If you feel like it and have nothing else to do, if the situation is right, if the doors open, go and make disciples. The situation couldn't have been worse when Jesus gave his orders to the disciples. Everything, all the doors were closed, everything was stacked up against them, but they did it, they obeyed, and that's the key to everything. I want to boil it down, and look, I'm not in a bad mood, but I'm... I'm going to say some hard things here. I want you to understand, buckle your seatbelts, because I'm going to get direct here. And I feel the authority and the weight of God's word behind what I'm about to say. You may not like it, but all I ask you to do is ask whether what I say has God's word behind it. We have created, I believe, an artificial Christianity in which people can classify themselves as good Christians because they go to church, give some money, work at the church, but really are not about the Great Commission. Ask people, just kind of do a poll of people who consider themselves good Christians, and then look at their lives and how they live their lives. People who are living immoral lives, but consider themselves good Christians. People who are more focused on politics, on cultural things, on fighting about this or that, but yet they consider themselves good Christians. And the Bible makes it clear you can't do that. They're more concerned about getting their way, but they're ignoring the Great Commission. This is disobedience. It's sin. I will state it as clearly as I can. If you and I are not actively living our lives in pursuit of the Great Commission of Jesus Christ, we have no business calling ourselves good Christians. We're living in sin and we need to repent. We may know the Bible, we may have the best theology, be the hardest working, uh, nicest people, be moral, but if we're not obeying the command the, the, the Savior gave us, our commanding officer, to take the message of Christ to the ends of the earth, we are not walking in obedience. If we're not living on the mission of God actively, we are in active sinful disobedience. If we wonder why the early church succeeded, where we're failing, where they had no resources, we have everything. 
But here's where we start, at least, the fact that we simply are not obeying, in general, the commission of God. <clears throat> we are about life in this world. And if we can fit a little Jesus into our lives, yay, ra. But we want to do it our way and fit Jesus in. And, if, and, I'm not, and I know that's not everybody. There's some real great commission people out there and around here but our lives are, are we were called when you're saved you're saved for a great commission life and that's what we're supposed to be about so what i want to get into today is the process of the great commission uh, and i'm going to get as far as i can into this and we'll pick up the rest of it next week and i don't care what some of you smart alex were smirking about a moment ago we will finish it next week okay the process of the Great Commission, that's in verses 19 and 20. These are our marching orders going into all the world to make disciples. Let's look at the commission, the Great Commission. Let's read the verses again. We, uh, we looked last week at Jesus came and told his disciples, I've, given all authority in heaven. I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. That's the premise. Jesus has the authority to tell you, to tell anyone, submit to me. I am Lord. I'm the boss. I, I lived a perfect life. I died for your sins. I rose up. I am Lord. I'm calling you to bow the knee to me. He has the right to do that. And then he says, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to teach them to observe Teach the, these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, what I want to do is lay this out. It is generally unhelpful to delve into the Greek language. Well, that just didn't work at all. I don't know why that didn't. Well, that just all popped up instead of coming up one at a time. I, there's, there's, uh, I, this all laid out with, with, uh, it just all popped up at once. It's supposed to come up one at a time, but let's, let's look at this and I'll point it with my little, my little pointing pointer here. Is that the pointer? There it is. Okay. It starts out with, therefore, Jesus has all authority. What there is in this passage is one main command and three participles. Now, I know that grammar like this warms your heart and soul like nothing else does, but this is important. In most translations, there are two or three commands. There's only one in this verse, and it is make disciples. Our command is to make disciples. That's what we are called to do, to make disciples. The three participles going, baptizing, and teaching tell us how we make disciples. We make disciples by going, by teaching, by baptizing, and by teaching. And that's what this passage says. Therefore, because Jesus has all authority, make disciples. How do we do that? By going, by baptizing, and by teaching. Now, I hope to cover the going, the making disciples, and the going today. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but I want to first of all cover uh, four spiritual realities that I think govern our lives. The, the grand cosmic scheme of things. First of all, it is God's purpose in this world to glorify himself by redeeming and transforming sinners. God redeems and transforms sinners that's what he does from the moment mankind fell into sin god has been working out his plan to redeem sinners from their sinful condition and transform them to be like christ so that they would be fit for heaven god is in the saving business he hasn't stopped doing that he is still in the saving business now here's the second principle, and I don't completely understand that, but he chose us as his agents in this world. Why? I don't know. 
he probably could have chosen better than to put it all on us, but we have been the agents of reconciliation. We are the body of Christ. And we, because we're the body, what does that mean, the body of Christ? It means we walk, Christ walks in this world through us. We're his body. He touches the world through us. He speaks to the world through us. We are his physical manifestation, representation in this world. Can Jesus appear miraculously? Can he send angels? Sure. But that's not his chosen course. He chose us as his means of acting and working in this world. Now, we haven't always been faithful in that. We're perhaps the weak link in his work, but that's what he, we are his agents of love in this world. Here's the key, folks. By God's sovereign plan, he has placed people in your life who need Jesus. My dad one time, he had a friend, famous preacher, who told a story that shocked people. Lady in his church down in Houston called him and said, Pastor, I have a neighbor, and I really believe my neighbor. She is very close to receiving Christ. And if you would just come and talk to her, she would, she would trust Christ. And the pastor then blew this dear lady's mind. He said, ma'am, your neighbor will die and go to hell before I will come and lead her to Christ. What? He said, now, I will come and I will sit with you and I will tell you Anything you need to know about how you can go to your neighbor and share with her. I will spend as much time as you need to instruct you on how to share Christ with your neighbor, answer any questions you might have, help you deal with any problems, but it's your job to witness to your neighbor. It's your job to lead her to Christ, and I'm not going to come and do your job for you. Now, he was a little... I can't believe he had the nerve, but do you see the point he's making? We have this idea that, you know, it's somebody else's job. Hey, I've got somebody that needs Christ. I'll call the, the hired man to do it. No. God has placed people in your family, <clears throat> in your neighborhood, <clears throat> at work, who need Jesus. And here is the fourth and final key. We need to take spiritual responsibility for those people. You and I do. We need to say, okay, Lord, if you place them in my life and I'm there, I am your hands, I'm your feet, I'm your voice, and I will follow your commands. And I will be part of, I'll be part of your mission to share Christ in this world. Do you remember the prime directive? We'll know who are trekkers here and who aren't. The prime directive is a Star Trek thing. Everything flows from the prime directive. I think it had to do with not interfering with other cultures, letting them grow up naturally. They had to follow it. They couldn't violate it. We have our own prime directive. Our prime directive is to make disciples. Make disciples, make disciples. Make, it doesn't say, listen, Jesus didn't say fill church buildings. That was not our prime directive. It doesn't say that we have to be the biggest, richest, fanciest, hippest, fastest growing church in town. It says we have to make disciples. And so the question is, what does it mean to make disciples? Let me give you an illustration. Let me first of all introduce you to group one. Group one is a large group of people made up of those who do as they please. They're rebellious at heart, refusing to obey God. They may or may not believe in God. In fact, they may be very religious. They may have gone to church all of their lives. But they live by their own will. 
they may know God's word very well, but they do what they want, not what God's word says. Their values are derived from the values of the world. In group one, people have three primary passions, driving passions. They live for themselves, their own ambitions, their own dreams, what they want, what feels good. It's all about number one. They seek pleasure. They want to enjoy life, have a good time. And finally, they live for money and the things of this world, the things money buys. Their favorite sport is gossip. They get angry and hold grudges. They live in immorality, physical or mental immorality. They do what they want when they want. They are, that's who they are. Uh, they just, just live as they please. Group two is different in every way. Group two is different. They're not perfect, but they live to glorify God and walk in obedience to God's word and God's will every single day. They seek to live as Christ lived, to be patient and gentle, to control their tongues and speak the truth in love. They seek to live in self-control, physically, mentally, in every way. They're diligent in their work. They, they realize they've got to you know, gotta, gotta work. But they've rejected materialism. It's not about just gathering money. They love their enemies and forgive those who hurt them, pray for them, seek ways to bless them. They're at peace in the middle of life's storms and they never worry about anything. They're kind to people regardless of how people treat them. They endure hardship while rejoicing in Christ and never give up on the call of God even when it gets hard. And when they sin, they confess that sin to God and find forgiveness. Now, those are polar extremes. But let's talk about group one versus group two. Group one is the normal human condition. That's the way we're born. Every one of us starts out in group one. Now, some people are raised better than other people. And they're able to kind of hide their group oneness a little bit better while others embrace sin and live the wild life and they're broken. And, but we all sin and fall short of the glory of God and we're born in group one, separated from God, living under the specter of the judgment of God and we have no hope outside of Christ. That's who we are. People in this group are like sheep who have gone astray and turned to their own ways, doing our own thing and we refuse Christ's help and Christ's hope. And he is our only help and our only hope. Group two, a much smaller group, that's the company of the redeemed. Not just those who have been saved, but those who are walking in obedience to Christ under the lordship of Christ. Now that description that I gave a moment ago of group two is idealized. <clears throat> I'm sure a lot of you said, well, that's what I want to be. It's not really what I am all the time. And if we're all honest, 100% of us said that. Even the most passionate Christian is going to say, yeah, that's what I want to be, but we fall short. And that's why we have verses like 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. Uh, it's how we should live, and it's our goal. But here's the point. Discipleship is a simple process of finding people in group one and moving them into group two. It's not hard. It is hard. It's supernatural. It's, it's a work of God. And he's chosen us as his agents <clears throat> to find people who are living in sin, rebellious against God, and bringing them under obedience to God so that they love God and serve him. It's going on in this world and le leading sinners who hate God, who reject God, who rebel against God, who don't want to be bothered by God, and leading them to live lives of full submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Group one to group two. I don't know why this is group one over here and group two over here, but uh, getting people to come to church isn't discipleship. Filling the church isn't discipleship. It's getting people to follow Jesus and to submit to his Lordship. Now, as we look at this process, we come to three, uh, three powerful participles. Three powerful participles that describe the process how we do this how we bring people from group one to group two now 
each one of these participles, please understand, has the full, and this is Greek grammar again, because they are subordinate to the main command, they have the force of a command themselves. Amen? You love that grammar, don't you? The command is make disciples. You do it going. But that, because of the construction, the going is also a command. The baptizing is also a command. The teaching is also a command. Uh, so it's not totally wrong to, to write those as commands in this text. It's just that you've got to understand the main command. It's not four commands. It's one command and three subordinate commands. Uh, the prime directive is make disciples, and the other ones are how you do it. So the first participle is going, and that's what I want to end with today, uh, is just kind of talking about what it means to be going. Now, there are two things, uh, two ways to look at this, and I think both have a justification here. First of all, the participle can be read as you're going or while you're going, um, too often in the church, we've made evangelism something you do on a special occasion. And, and you know, it, it's good to have special occasions, to have evangelistic activities, visitations, revivals, meetings, events, mission trips, things like that. Those are important opportunities to do evangelism. But when we make evangelism something that you do, outside of your normal schedule, we miss the boat. Evangelism, disciple-making, making disciples is supposed to be something you do as you're going. Your family, your friends, your neighbors, in your life, whatever you're doing, everywhere you go, everything you do, every person you meet, it's all, every, every step you take, you have to have your eyes open for divine appointments, divine encounters, opportunities. You know, we do this when we're in Africa. Everywhere we go, we're looking for opportunities. We're looking for a chance to say something, to share something, uh, to turn a conversation to Christ. If we just did here what we do there, we'd be disciple-making. If we just lived here, if I just lived here like I lived there, it would be a whole different ballgame. Listen, we aren't farmers and engineers and teachers and homemakers and business persons or whatever else you are. We are disciple makers who have those jobs, but our, our, our mission is to make disciples whatever we're doing, wherever we're going, in whatever role God gives us as we're going. Now, that doesn't mean... I, you know, we, 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 whatever we're doing, all of us are to be making disciples, but the participle still has the force of a command. I remember being asked once, I think it was early in my ministry here, and I'm glad I can't remember who exactly asked this, because I don't want to think ill of one person in particular, but I've been asked this before, why do we go on mission trips? when there are still lost people in Sioux City. You know, when, when there are still lost people here, why do we spend money to go, at the time we were going to Pascagoula and uh, Bay St. Louis and New Orleans right after Katrina, and then we went to Montana, and then we, we did um, Taiwan a couple of times, and there's been trips to India, India and Haiti, and then of course 11 trips now to, to Senegal, why are we spending all that money and time and effort when there's lost people here? And the answer to that is very simple. Jesus told us to. And if we don't go, we're disobeying the one who died for our sins. We have to go. He said in Jerusalem. Now, if we only go and we don't minister here, we're also disobedient. We have to minister in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, 
But if we ignore the uttermost parts of the earth, we're disobeying. I love the fact that our church has supported all those mission trips, that we have been the leading church giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering in the whole state of Iowa for the last 20 years. I think, it's not a matter of bragging about it, I guess I just did brag, didn't I? I? But I think whatever other problems we might have as a church, I think it gives God a reason to, to bless this church. To, to keep us going because we're, we're looking out. We're not just, and, and we haven't exactly reaped all the fruit we'd hoped to reap, but we have looked at ways to reach out. This is, you cannot say about this church that we haven't done evangelistic ministries. I don't know why we haven't seen the fruit that we'd like to see from it, but we have done tons of evangelistic ministries. And when we do ministries, we make sure that they're evangelistic. Because we are commanded to go, to go into Siouxland, to go into our region, and to go into all the world. Too many churches today have, an, have developed an inward focus. And we must not do it. Yes, we need fellowship. We need to gather and teach God's Word and worship Him in spirit and truth. We've got to come together and retreat from the world and encourage one another. But we are an army, not a social club. We gather together so that we can go out and, and fight the fight that has to be fought. We don't arm soldiers so they can look pretty marching in parades. We arm soldiers because there's a war to be fought. And we gather together in the church to encourage one another because there's a fight that has to be fought. Because there are people that need Jesus. There's a world dying in sin. Let me tell you something. If this church or any church has the best preaching in America, the best theology anywhere, the best music in the land, the best programs imaginable, but if we are not going, we are disobedient to the call of God. We cannot say, well, we've got this great church. Come to our great church because we've got wonderful programs and we've got fantastic facilities and we've got great this and great that. But if we are not about the orders, the prime directive that God has given us, if we're focused on ourselves, on being a, quote, good church and good Christians, but we're not focused on the prime directive Jesus gave us, then we are kidding ourselves. We're kidding ourselves. We're, we're artificial churches with artificial good Christians and not the genuine thing. And we must never allow ourselves to be that. We've constantly got to look at our lives individually and our ministries as a church and say, are we about the prime directive? Are we a great commission church? And it's not so much, I mean, I think a lack of results should give us pause, but we can't look at the results. We've got to look at the effort. Now next week, we'll finish this message. Did you hear the, the sarcasm in that? This unanticipated mini-series. We'll look at evangelism and discipleship, finishing the process of making disciples. We'll look at how God promises to give Davids like us his presence as we go out to face the Goliaths of this world, he'll empower us. But here's the thing, if we find that individually we're off mission, or as a church we're off mission, then first of all we have to repent. It is a sin when we are not on mission with God. When we're not following the prime directive, it's sin. And we must recommit ourselves. Our Lord has commanded us and we must obey Him. We must offer again our bodies as living sacrifices and say, you have me, Lord. You have me. I will be yours. And however I can, 
whatever I can do. For some, it may just be praying. And whatever limited role you can do, it can involve giving, although that generally shouldn't be the only thing. Maybe it's just ministering to friends with cards and letters and sharing Christ. Whatever way you can, however God leads you, just say, I want to be part of the prime directive, the Great Commission. Will you today recommit yourself to the Great Commission, our Lord and Savior's prime directive, not for preachers or deacons or leaders in the church, but for every person whoever goes to the cross of Christ, every blood-bought, born-again believer has this commission laid at their feet. Go and make disciples. It's for you and you and you and me. Father in heaven, may we take this commission seriously. Fill our hearts with the knowledge that we must, absolutely must, be faithful to you in all things. That we cannot pretend that everything's okay if we're just good church people doing good things and not living out the Great Commission. Father, speak to us, lead us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.